Let's begin. Hey there, scary story fanatics. Welcome back to Cleaving Thought from Bone with your host, Sociopathic. It's time we all go on a hunt together and rediscover where we've been. So, settle in by your monitor screens for a retelling of a ghastly tale that I like to call Ghost Story. Scientific inquiry is the examination and analysis of observable phenomena. It has been stated by scientists the world over that the scientific method is only one method of examination, and although it is the best known approach currently, its dynamics are ill-equipped to deal with constructs that cannot be observed, such as the supernatural. This is not to say that the paranormal does not exist because science has yet to prove it. Instead, it means that the supernatural world may indeed exist, despite the implication of humanity's best-known method of inquiry, science. I like to think of myself as a scientist at heart, particular to the concepts of the social sciences. Even so, I am also a firm believer in ghosts and the happenings of paranormal events. As a child, the idea of an afterlife and what it may consist of fascinated me. As I got older, I grew away from my childish wonders and studied more academic concepts. Attaining a relatively well-paying job as a psychiatry data technician, I found the pay and benefits substantial enough for satisfaction, but the performance of duty-related tasks, such as continual transcription, became monotonous after only a few months of employment. Single, I put some money aside for the procurement of some equipment related to my passion, paranormal investigation. It's not something I'd ever gotten paid to do before. Some college buddies and I used to dabble in it on the weekends ones where we weren't consumed with our coursework, and I found it invigorating, like rattling off the dust of my childhood and making me feel alive. After a few moments of saving for and buying equipment and recruiting a couple of my friends, it wasn't long before we started researching our own first location to investigate. We knew it would have to be someplace relatively close by, as each of us had work on Monday and we knew that we would need to receive the appropriate permission. I was hoping my investment would eventually pay off and allow me to swap in for my current painfully boring profession for a more stimulating one. After much deliberation and a few phone calls, we were actually able to get a hold of the owner of an allegedly haunted property, only a short 45-minute drive away. The site was a cliché abandoned mental institution. I had explored a few abandoned homes before. Once I had even investigated an operating funeral home after hours, but nothing close to the size of the property which we were now hoping to examine. The interior of the institution was recorded to be well over 150,000 square feet in space. What deemed the location investigatable was the boundless reports of unexplainable noises and apparitions that were reported to echo and roam about its corridors. Incidents ranged from the occasional shadow figure, always seen with its gleaming green eyes, to reported scratching and screaming noises said to belong to the patients that used to reside within. The great thing about this place is that 
reports of supernatural phenomena exceeded the period of abandonment and reached back into the time of operation. Many doctors and nurses employed at the institution reported seeing shadowy masses, usually first mistaken for a loose mental patient, and scratching within the walls. No reports of patients seeing or hearing anything unnatural was ever logged, presumably because the mentally ill are prone to seeing and reporting such events, which are usually constructs of a diseased mind. With a little research and determination, I was able to get in touch with a real estate broker employed by the agency who currently owned the property. Being a representative of his organization, the man agreed to meet with us the morning of investigation and agreed to allow us to remain overnight, unchaperoned, assuming that I was legit. Enthused, I contacted my cobbled-together team of companions and prepared myself for one hell of a weekend. We left early, meeting up at Kevin's house and hitting the open road as the sun was just beginning to rise. Sure enough, the man who had agreed to meet me was there, standing upon the steps in the front, awaiting our arrival, just as he had promised. Kevin, Chuck, and Carla began unpacking the van when we had arrived, while I walked up to greet the man. I instantly recognized the vacancy of the place, as ours and his vehicle were the only ones to be seen in the gravel lot, marking the end of the long, bumpy driveway. Walking past his black caravan, parked only a feet from our white one, I lifted a hand hello and approached him. He extended his own when I got close enough, initiating a resulting handshake. As he walked me through the building, he told me to always be vigilant of my step and surroundings, and divulged a few stories relating to noises and shadow creatures, in accordance with the location of which they occurred, helping me to mark out the spots to be investigated closely later. We walked mostly the first and second floors, having to take the stairs as a result of the elevators not working easily signified by both the lack of power and blatant abuse by vandals over the decades that the place sat forgotten by everyone except local teenagers trying to score a good place for a beer party. Evidence of their presence was everywhere. Empty beer cans and cigarette butts littered the floor, amongst debris from crumbling plaster and fallen, deteriorated acoustical ceiling tile. Before too long, we had made our way back into the lobby area, the crew all setting up the various laptops, cameras, and other electrical equipment that would serve as our investigative tools. Once we were set and the broker left us to our thing, we spent the rest of the morning and afternoon exploring and mapping ideal locations for EVP recordings and camera equipment. Combined with these tools, one thermal camera and an EMF device for each of us, we were primed and set for recording and documenting before the onset of darkness. We spent hours that evening combing the grounds in groups and separately. No scratching, screaming, or anything worth noting, paranormally speaking. It was about 1.17 a.m. when stationary camera number three positioned at the end of the second floor's western corridor, began blipping with static before the monitor went black completely. Alone in the lobby, now our base of operations, I radioed the rest of the team, now exploring the east wing of the first floor, about the malfunction and that I was heading over to take a look, possibly fix the issue. They affirmed receipt of my transmission, and off I went. The stairs creaked beneath my feet, each plank groaning with age. Once at the top of the steps, using my flashlight, I made my way to the left and down the western corridor. Doors on each side, leading to rooms previously occupied by previous residents, were all open, most of which torn from a hinge. 
hanging in some odd fashion. The building looked as old and decrepit as one would expect a haunted structure to look, predictable in its appearance. Despite as creepy a feel that the place had, nothing frightening or physics-defying occurred on my way to the stationary camera at the end of the long hall. Not so much as a sound, except for that of my own. Nothing as I approached, and then I heard a loud bang to my left. I turned to see a man in a dirty brown coat run out from an open door behind me and take off down the hall, towards the stairs. Hey! I yelled, ignoring the thud noise behind me, assumedly that of the camera being tipped and knocked to the floor, and I began running after him. He proved much faster than I and was out the front door before I was able to make it to the top of the stairs. The building was supposed to be empty. This guy was likely trying to mess with our equipment, providing what we would think of as a possibly supernatural instance that was nothing more than a prank, designed for an unknown end. I tried radioing the team, but my walkie wasn't working for some odd reason. The weird happening only supported my assumptions. I figured that maybe the guy had placed a jammer somewhere in the building. Checking the whereabouts of the team on the monitors in the lobby, I headed towards their location in the eastern wing of the ground floor. I was only about halfway to where they were depicted on the monitor when I realized that they must have heard the commotion, because the three of them were now seen coming forth from the darkness and running in my direction. As I jogged up to them, I tried to explain what happened and that we should call someone, but they just ran past, ignoring my words. They must have been really shaken up, and more so than I, because I couldn't help but notice the lights on their EMF devices each was holding blinking with activity, from what I understand to be the first time in the whole time we had been there. They really didn't seem to care or notice. As they ran by and increased the distance between them and I, I began to jog up after them and call out. That's when I noticed something else strange. Their footsteps. Their voices. Everything had an echo. Everything except my footsteps. My voice. I could no longer hear the reverberation of my vocal cords being refracted off the floors and ceilings. As I approached the well-lit lobby, I saw each one of them check the black monitor, linked to the camera upstairs, before instantly rushing up the stairs and to the second floor. The screen for the camera still black as I passed by, I followed them to the camera stationed at the end of the hall on the second floor's western wing. I traced their path, and my previous one, back to the point of which I had encountered the man. At first, as I approached them, I thought their flashlights were shining and focused upon the camera that had been knocked over. Hey, guys! I spoke once again. But no one responded. No one even looked at me. I peered around Kevin's left side to see a terrifying sight that shook my very soul. It took a while for my mind to grasp. I wouldn't believe it as I began shouting to my friends that I was right there. My attempts were deemed futile by a further lack of response. Slowly, I began to wrestle with the concept that my perception was shoving into my face, making it completely undeniable. Carla called the police and they were there in about an hour. Not long after, the building was flooded with searchlights, detectives, and yellow caution tape. Upon investigation of the surrounding rooms and video footage that we had captured, I overheard a policeman tell all three of them that the man in the brown coat, seen leaving the lobby from Camera 5, is named Arnie Benjamin. He was currently wanted in relation to a string of home invasion cases and had been on the run from police for a few months. Search of the rooms, nearby the upstairs camera, revealed a room in which he had been squatting in. 
hoping to avoid detection. Apparently, he perceived our presence as a threat and was attempting to sneak away when I happened by him. Startled, the man shot me, resulting in the thump that I had heard in the corpse that my friends had discovered. I saw it for myself. I lay up there, motionless on the floor, blood persistently leaking from the wound in the back of my broken skull, eyes red and bloodshot, skin an unnatural shade of gray. At the time, it seemed like that night lasted forever. Now, looking back, thinking about the endless days, weeks, and years that have passed since then, it looks like only moments for me. I cannot leave, and this place has forever become my eternal tomb. Science may not be able to prove its existence, but I know that the paranormal is real. I have become a part of it. It seems that when you can't find them or beat them, just join them. Problem solved, right? Well, I'll let you be the judge of that, and I hope you decide to come back and haunt me again next weekend. And until then, make sure to like, share, subscribe, and turn on notifications so I can catch you all again next Saturday. <laughs> <laughs>